that's quite dark, but that's the shiny page. And um, a couple of interesting things. They had, when I did this uh, 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 snapshot, about 80,000 applications running on, on their service. Probably most of them are Hello World, uh, but even so, there's lots of people trying it out. Um, you deploy by pushing to Git, so you've you know, done your work on your code, it's all running nicely on your local version of, uh, of your Git repository, you push to a Git repo, and suddenly your application springs up out of nowhere. It's got various things like add-ons, so you can, without having to get a sysadmin to configure everything and set it uh, together, you can do log file analysis, load balancing, um, added databases, various other you know, funky things. And the other thing, of course, is it's growing quite fast. So I did these slides back in uh, October, I think, and now from 80,000, it's grown to 105,000 applications. Again, probably more Hello Worlds. But uh, people are using this stuff and, uh, and quite enthusiastically. Or if they're not using it enthusiastically, they're working with very good marketing, gear, which is also something to learn from. So the question, of course, is that's a Ruby service. Why doesn't it exist for Perl? Uh, so why isn't that a Catalyst application rather than a Rails application? And so the same kind of things apply. It would be nice if, having written the web application, <coughs> you can try it out in the cloud trivially by pushing to Git. It doesn't have to be pushing to Git. The magic button could be hoist the deploy, or you know, you go to a web page and fill in some details, and again, your application is, is deployed. The important thing is uh, really reducing the barriers to driving the application out uh, live. And you can think of some really good reasons why you might want to do that. If you're a team that's trying Perl, how easy is it to write an application in Perl? Hack for a day, uh, give your boss uh, a URL that's actually living on the, uh, on the internet, not just on you know, your machine or your local network. Uh, it's quite a nice story to be able to tell. Also, if we have projects, for example, Perl community projects like CPAN ratings, uh, a new version of Search, CPAN at all, etc., to get those provisioned deployed on, on Perl servers isn't easy, it's not hard and there's people there with the will to do it, but if we reduce the barriers to entry, we can get more people uh, contributing that kind of thing. So, uh, changing topics slightly, there are many Perl groups across the world, and one of them is obviously in London, one of the bigger groups is in London, but the UK isn't just London. Some of this may come as a surprise to some of the Londoners here, of course. Um, uh, and up in the Grim North, where people eat pies and uh, uh, like whippets, I'm not quite sure what a whippet is, is it? Dog, I think. Ah, a racing dog. A strange up north. Um, obviously, further north than me, because I've never seen uh, a whippet. Uh, um, Rosso de Pena, isn't it? Uh, oh, right, Rosso de Yeah, that would be a fun idea. Uh, there's a group called North West England Carbongers, and as you can see, whereas London is you know, a single town, North West England Carbongers spreads <coughs> out a large distance. And that's partly a strategic thing, in that if we had a Liverpool Carbongers meeting, I would get very bored in the pub. Um, and Manchester Carbongers meeting would work, uh, but it would be all the people from Manchester Evening News uh, having worked with each other for the day going to the pub. And drinking. Similarly, Lancaster, Shadow Cat guys probably go to the pub anyway. So, uh, being a smaller, uh, being a more sparsely populated, let's say, area for Perl programmers, having spread out over large distances is quite handy. Of course, the problem is then people have to travel quite far in order to get to a meeting. And the way that uh, uh, Mark Keating and Ian Norton have actually dealt with this problem is by having a bit of a travelling service. So, if you in Chester or Liverpool or, or where you want to have a North West England Parliament meeting, you call them on their back phone uh, and uh, they'll immediately leap into action. And all you have to do is provide them with the name of a pub, maybe a booking a pub, tell them where to meet and they'll come around next month and, uh, and bring uh, a new, the alcoholic penguin, in must not. Um, and you can have a Parliament meeting, again, in the North West area, obviously. You, know, you poor guys in London will miss out on that one. And it's a business. 
Uh, and most of the meetings, to be fair, tend to happen in Manchester because that's where the biggest uh, conglomeration of people are. There's a, uh, currently a large employer there, Manchester Evening News, who really to the Guardian were until they sold, they sold out to the Daily Mail. Um, uh, so there's a group of colour members there. Um, we often have technical meetings and also the speakers, so you know, do come. Uh, you know, if you are in the group, then it will be arranged there. Make sure you go to BBC Salford guys. BBC what? Salford guys. Okay. Yes, yeah, absolutely. If they're still writing Pearl, that one. Yes, they're probably going to be writing Java or pretending to write Java but actually writing Pearl, which I think is what they do at the BBC. Lovely! So, let's look at Pearl numbers. And obviously, Pearl numbers are quite active. For example, some of you may have noticed the name Mark Eaton in the context of the London Pearl workshop because he organises it. Uh, I'm not sure how he manages to do that from several hundred miles away, but he does. He's obviously insane. Um, Mark's also uh, recently had a baby who is doing the registrations, some of you may have been there, uh, and your badge given out to, uh, by the and, and by uh, Mark's wife, Lee. Um, he's obviously not busy enough, so we need to give him more things to do. Um, one of the things that Mark was doing in was like to do is almost a hat day. And last year they ran a project some of you may have heard of called Iron Man. And Iron Man basically comes from, again, one of the irritations of Pearl that we all talk in an echo chamber. We used to talk on usepearl.org and you know, irc.pearl.org, two other Pearl programmers would go, oh, is the Pearl great? Oh, yes, it is, yeah, that's great. And it's all very nice and it's good that we have these social events and talk to each other. But getting the, the message outside the echo chamber is also important. And loads of people are doing stuff like that, Gabor is uh, sending people to non pearl conferences and so on. But um, Iron Man was basically a blog aggregator. So the idea is it's a planet, uh, uh, an RSS uh, aggregator for all kinds of pearl-related uh, blogs, with an additional gamification aspect that if you post every day uh, for <coughs> or whatever the rules are, you will become Iron Man. And if you post every day for half a month, you become Stone Man. And if you post once, you're paint man and various less pleasant substances if you post less of them. Um, and this didn't, of course, happen in one day, but there was a hat day where the basis of this uh, project was done. Uh, it wasn't only North West England Uh Cast Away uh, also worked on that uh, remotely uh, via the internet, via the power of broadband. Um, and most people have worked on that both uh, in the Northwest and Globally, I'll say, because no one's going to check it out when they do this talk. Um, so that was the project in 2009, which was the day and the following year. Um, and in 2010, of course, it was that last project. You know, it was a, an absolute mystery. And the idea that uh, the market had had was to submit, uh, to have proposals for a project. And uh, so a little bit of a kind of dragon's den, uh, but with Pearl projects. Um, and I submitted a project called Oyster, um, subtitled An Incubator of Pearls in the Cloud. It's a terrible one. Uh, Oyster also isn't actually um, an entirely free namespace. There was a project called Oyster, um, but I think the developer for that Ping Mark, uh, Ping and Matt Proud and said, yeah, it's fine. I wasn't using the database anyway, so it's now ours. Uh, it, it, it's a little bit overloaded with uh, London Transport's uh, Oyster Card, but hey ho. So I submitted that project uh, to be possibly hacked on uh, for the Corporate Single Club Lovers Hack Day, uh, but um, Mark pointed out why should we only do one project when we could do crazy amounts of things? So as well as doing uh, Oyster, we voted to carry on supporting Iron Man, so this blog emulator, and also work on Presenting Pearl, which is another quite exciting project, which is basically a repository for all of the conference video and slides and audio and other related information from these conferences that we, that we do. There's various initiatives, there's also Yapsi TV, which uh, Andrew Shitov from uh, Yapsi Russia has set up. That's more focused on just videos, Presenting Pearl is trying to be a holistic kind of repository of stuff that comes out of workshops and uh, conferences. So we decided to do all of these things and, and a few more. Uh, this upset Ingu, he had to go to the pub to uh, uh, have a bit of a drink. Um, 
to calm his nerves. Um, so that's the Shadow Cat offices, or part of the Shadow Cat offices. And we've got quite a good turnout of uh, somewhere in the region of 20, 15 to 20 people. Um, which, and we were quite cramped in that space. Which is a good thing, a good problem to have. So we're also joined by the Glasgow Boys, uh, which actually a very good exhibition at the moment at the RA, if we're interested in, uh, uh, in Scottish art. Uh, not those Glasgow Boys, these ones. Um, so Marco Fontani has recently set up uh, Glasgow Pearlmongers, and he came down with uh, three people from Scotland to, uh, uh, to come and happen on the project, which is quite, quite exciting. But they were the people who came from the from furthest away. We also had uh, uh, Gabby, who yeah, was here, uh, come to us all the way from Munich, so that was quite exciting. And we had uh, uh, cast away on the internet again. Um, uh, and of course we had various people from that you can't see uh, in that photo. Uh, they're very beautiful and I had to, it's such a shame that the photo is that dark. Um, mostly from North West England, uh, there were some from Lancaster, I came out from Liverpool, lots of people from Manchester um, working on the project. And at some point we ran out of chairs, so again, you can't see one of our lessons on the floor. So, last year, Ian wrote some really good notes on how to run a hack day, the things to do and the things not to do. So I read his blog post, absorbed all of the lessons in it, and then promptly forgot them all. Uh, but we did try to follow one of the lessons, which was do a bit of upfront planning about how you're going to structure uh, the hacking and who's going to do what, what kind of tasks need to be done so that people are more clear on it. We didn't do an especially good job on it, but we did a little bit better than, uh, than she had, which is nice. So we tried to split up into uh, client teams, back end, and deployment, and what I'm calling infrastructure, which was testing, documentation, and marketing. Um, and I'll explain a little bit about the kind of things that we were doing and the lessons that we learned from that. I missed out one team member, there's uh, Matt Fout. I was going to put a joker there, but actually I thought he was a, a pretty flower, which would represent uh, Matt's personality part. <laughs> so, from the client team, I, I worked with a couple of guys from, uh, from Manchester, formerly of Manchester Evening News, they've all moved on to <coughs> other things. And we were trying to work on the client side of things. And what that means is that, from the user story, if you're going to be writing a Perl application, you want to have all of the libraries, so you know, the best practice things like you know, Catalyst and Moose and uh, um, various other libraries are, uh, that you're going to be using. Um, all chosen for you, and also you want a command line application that will basically be that magic button, so that you can type in Oyster deploy or you know Oyster get me a server um, and call it you know Foobar, whatever. Um, we decided to look at using a module called Disczilla, which is a set of scripts and modules to package and release CPAN, uh, large release models to CPAN, and, and uh, make some of those tasks easier. And the nice thing about this filler is that it works with loads of plugins. So it has functionality to check what dependencies you've got in your application, or to check stuff into Git, or to SCP a tarball to another server, and so on. And all these things were things that we, we were going to need. So it also has some, some mind share, and it's also one of the modules that's uh, blessed in Task Show. And what Task Show is, is almost trying to get the same kind of idea of, uh, of uh, uh, Java Enterprise Edition. It's a set of blessed Perl modules that have been uh, recommended by people from the uh, Enlightened Perl organization as being really rather good modules. If you're going to be hacking in Perl, why not use those? Or at least look at those and see whether there's something in, in, in that. So we thought, let's look at this in there and see whether it fits the mindset of what we want to do. So the idea is that the Oyster Magic Button script will basically be a wrapper around this in there. And one of the things we've learned is that 
Well, it is one of those things, and it is a very fantastic piece of engineering. It's actually quite hard to reuse, partly because our team wasn't as skilled in using loose and uh, as bad as should have been, and didn't really know how to use distillate. It's a, it's a complex framework which makes a lot of assumptions and requires uh, a certain mindset for, for, for how you kind of extend it. So we actually found it quite hard to do, to, to use, and probably for the purpose of a hack day, we really wouldn't want to do is go, here's a shiny toy we did in the day, which is quite a nice sort of message to, to, to give out in terms of marketing after the event. Uh, we found a lot of the time spent in, in hacking at Priscilla and, and trying to understand what the hell it was doing, which has made it a little bit counterproductive. And uh, I think uh, Matt uh, made the comment that Distiller had those features um, and it might be coding ourselves into a corner to be relying on that straight away. And I think that would probably be kind of uh, a fair point to have made. So we may move away from using Distiller or possibly uh, bring it in later on because it does a load of really clever stuff and probably end up using the modules that it calls out to. Uh, but the actual front end uh, oyster tool may be based on something else eventually. Um, provisioning is basically getting a machine to run on the cloud. So that could be running on Amazon's last uh, um, computing cloud, EC2, uh, or it could be using Rackspace, um, which is another uh, system that allows you to do bring up machines on, on a cloud. Um, um, they're actually quite different, even though they're basically doing the same thing. Um, the way that you talk to them is different, and, and the way that you deploy them is, uh, uh, is different. With, uh, with Amazon, you can store a machine image, like here's the server and all of the dependencies that we want on it, um, and just bring that up. And with Rackspace, you can't do that. They have a, a limited number of, of uh, machine images that you can choose from, and then anything else you want, you've got to write that onto it. So we've learned a lot about how to, how to resolve those differences and have different drivers to, to do that kind of thing. Um, so we were originally going to just look at Amazon, and one of the beauties of doing a hack day is that people have their own issues that they want to scratch. And uh, Marco, who come down, has actually written some CPAN modules that speak to Rackspace. And he was really keen on providing a, a, a Rackspace backend, so, uh, so he went ahead and did that. And in fact, the Rackspace uh, code is now actually more advanced than, than the Amazon target. And one of the lessons that Matt pointed out is that having these multiple backends uh, keeps your code honest in a way, and it keeps it flexible and able to, to target um, multiple things without making too many assumptions. So I think it's a really good thing that we had people who wanted to uh, try and make us do more. Uh, within the same framework. Uh, for deployment, um, Matt actually tried to hit us with a clue back right at the beginning by saying we shouldn't be trying to do pushing things to it, uh, we should be using tarballs because tarballs are the unit of distribution for Perl applications. So I think it's a fair point. Um, we did decide to go with using Git, um, and the reason for that is twofold. One of which is that it's shiny, and the people working with the deployment team particularly wanted to scratch that itch. And again, it's a hack day, and people want to do stuff that's interesting to them uh, at the end of the day. And the other is a big prior art in, in terms of Heroku, uh, the Ruby uses that as its deployment uh, strategy. So we were trying to kind of copy that and, uh, and, and see how that goes. So we didn't handle the deployment side of things very well, partly because it's uh, we were learning about how to how to do the uh, how to handle these problems, and we didn't have a very clear idea about how we'd actually do the deployment. Uh, so yeah, this I think isn't as far ahead as I would like to the back end uh, code. We also were very I think we're lucky to have people with us to work your coders. So we had uh, uh, Gabby who's come from a testing and documentation background, uh, Latif, similar background, and also Mark who worked <coughs> on, uh, on uh, Logo for, for Oyster. And um, I was effectively, I think, originally hoping that I'd you know, propose this project and now people will you know, magically come together in some 
so that every actually will work out what we're doing and it's all be wonderful. And I think people were looking at me thinking, oh, you're first managing this and you know all the answers, which is quite an interesting mismatch. And I think I mishandled a number of things, but none more so than not really taking advantage of uh, the guys from the documentation and testing teams. So we didn't bring them into each of the groups to help discuss what we were doing. Um, and part of that, again, from lack of project management experience, is this temptation always to bring in testing later. Like, well, I haven't quite finished coding, let me just do that now, and then you can come in and document and test it, and so on. And, and, and that was a mistake. So this could certainly be improved uh, later. We did have a few notable successes for that, down to uh, Gabby and Atif. So uh, Gavin, come on out and see and point out, oh, I knew something that you published on your API on, on the wiki, it doesn't work, here's a stack trace. Um, and this was really good for keeping us honest. We'd written, oh, you know, our code will do this, and then it didn't. So we had to go back and actually fix it and, and, and make it happen. So, although it, this is definitely an area that we, we could do with improvement, uh, I think it's a really important area for future hack days and something that uh, I will certainly be trying to do better. I think we could probably, uh, it, it's a useful lesson to learn. So, we did do more planning than, uh, than last year, uh, but not as much as we needed to. Part of that, of course, is that Oyster is frighteningly big. Um, if you think we're basically trying to replicate a uh, project which a Ruby on Rails startup uh, are doing with, I don't know how many programmers, several uh, you know, millions of venture capital, and, uh, and a lot more than you know, one day of programming efforts. Um, we're trying to replicate that, plus all the kind of pearl goodies like making it much more flexible and have multiple backends and, uh, and scratch various itches and, and so on. So there was no way that we would actually have done what we'd like to do within the one day. Uh, that said, um, uh, it's still a lesson to, to take from that. I think not being an established project may be something that uh, is problematic for a hack day because a lot of discussion has to be about well, how are we going to do this? Are the ground rules for this project uh, sensible? Do we want to do it a different way? And um, in a way, it might be a good idea for future hack days to actually take an existing project rather than an entirely new uh, and, you know, and uh, exciting one. That's a question. I don't know what the answer is to that. Um, so we did learn lots about how you would go about uh, trying to clone something like Heroku using Perl. And that's a good thing. Um, I think one lesson is that we, we didn't target enough, let's get something that we can come out and go, we've done this now. And uh, uh, one of the things that Marco is going to be working on, or what he is working on at the moment, is rather than taking a whole catalyst application, getting the Mojo Vicious app, which has very few dependencies, and making that rather than say, hello world on a Raspberry server. <coughs> and purely to have, we can post a blog saying, we have done something that will provision an application uh, on Rackspace. Uh, a nice, simple marketing lesson, and we didn't get anything like that out of, out of that day. And uh, it may be a good idea to try and get something done uh, during a hack day, rather than you know, little bits of everything uh, even if those things are all useful. And another lesson from that day for me is don't try to do so much code, but actually move around the different teams and try and mix things up and do more facilitating and mentoring, which I think is what experienced project managers like Matt and other people uh, already know that lesson. So it's a good one. Back to the flavour and uh, shiny distinction. Um, there are many flavours of pearl. You have baby pearl, functional pearl, which is always very interesting, and probably the most uh, popular type of pearl at the moment is object-oriented pearl using mousse. Um, mousse again is part of Task Ken Show, which is this uh, idea of, of, of a set of enlightened pearl modules, and Given Pearl's reputation for one-liners, obfuscations, uh, write-only, unbeatable code, 
enlightenment now is, is one of the really big things that we want to be selling to, to the outside world. And one of the things that uh, Oyster is going to try to do is promote Task Engine. So the basic build for the client and for the server applications will be probably running either the whole of Task Engine Show or you know, some uh, kind of fillet of that. Um, there's questions about that. Like, you know, is that sensible for that space where we have to uh, bring in all the dependencies the dark part of their standard uh, build? And one of the things we found from um, from the hack day was that it was also a little bit tricky to install. Uh, but I think maybe on Windows machines, and that's something that uh, Matt told me of already for uh, whining about to be part of install problems, submitting particular uh, <laughs> reports or patches. So that's something we can probably contribute back to uh, uh, back to the community in terms of bug reports at least. So, if you're interested in Oyster and you'd like to get involved, there's loads to do, as you may have got the impression. Um, on the last the law phase now has Oyster. Um, well, a lot of discussion takes place also as the law of the And um, we don't have a dedicated web page for Oyster yet, but we do have the wiki on uh, uh, law of the And we've got a little bit of time for questions. If anyone has any. Yeah, I'm just, just thinking about the whole logistics of running a hack done. I'm horribly wondering is there any money you can get from the phone or any cut down some agile with you know, two hour sprints and stuff? So, so the question is, is, is there any mileage in uh, applying uh, <coughs> and, and sort of two-hour sprints to the project? Depends on how the system you get with your reputation budget. Or you can just go here some some quick distribution tasks and who can understand that you see what sites are. Yes, I think you're right, there would be mileage from that. And I think given given the kind of lack of tourists and so on, I think to to, to organise a half day is it, it, quite a big overhead. And to organise a two hour sprint, for example, uh, uh, at a weekend say we will try to be on, on IRC at this time to run certain things might well be a really good way to structure. You, just think that. you might have something with all less from the you know, some sort of sacrifice goals of yes. two hour or after the day as well. Yes. yes, yes, you're right. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much.